Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, thank you, Tina, for that. Um, I, uh, I thank you for this amazing series. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I, uh, so Tina told me that I could talk about whatever I wanted. Uh, so I decided um, to, I'm gonna tell you a story about indoor plumbing. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a story about indoor plumbing and then I'm going to complicate it. And then I'm gonna tell you another story about a card game and I'm gonna complicate that too. Because uh, both of these stories uh, touch on uh, what I do, what I've done for 20 years, which is tell stories on the radio and in podcasts. They get at something really important, I believe. Uh, and they also have gotten me into arguments with young people. <laughs> so, um, just to jump in. So this story... Uh, about plumbing begins in 2015. It begins with me in a kind of a funk. So this is me, 2015. Uh, my friend Melissa calls this uh, position the, uh, the hunch, the jad hunch. And it's one of those things that I wouldn't even notice. I'd be editing stories uh, and people would be sending me drafts as MP3 and I'd be listening. And over the course of maybe an hour, uh, my body would just fold in like one of those plants that you touch and it goes, whoo, you know, like. And, uh, and one day she finds me in the state and she would take pictures just to show me how ridiculous I look. And, and she was like, you're doing that thing again. Let's go outside, let's go for a walk. So, okay, fine. So we walk outside. Now at this point, my world of Manhattan was confined to one square block. I would walk out of the station, take a right, then a left, grab some lunch, left, grab some coffee, left, left, back in the building. <laughs> and it was fine, it was good. I could do all the things I needed to do in 10 minutes and get back to work. So on this particular day with my friend Melissa, uh, we took a right and a left and a left, and then she said, hey, do you wanna go over here? <laughs> and I said, uh, I, I don't do that. I, I don't go that way. But she's like, come on, we'll go to the, we'll go to the river, we'll get some air. I said, okay, fine, five minutes. So we start walking down this brand new block. Within 20 steps, I arrive at the following uh, sign. It says, complete, complete, compliat, sculptor. Like New York is full of these things where you're like, what is that? Is that a, is that a business? Is that a store? Is it big in there? Is it small? I don't know. So we walk up to, the, to the, uh, the, the front of the store, and it's kind of glary, so we can't see inside. She was like, do you want to go in and see what it is? I said, no, I want to go back to work. <laughs> She's like, come on, five minutes. Let's just check it out. Fine. So we walk inside, and this is what we see. Some kind of art supply place, but with a, like a cabinet of curiosity thing going on. Like there were skulls lying around and chis, oh my God, so many chisels. So many chisels, you could put them all together and it would stretch from here to California. There were that many. And then there were uh, like plaster feet just in display cases. And these metal tools that looked like maybe uh, were used in torture or something. There were Yodas and, and, and werewolves and, and cherubs just all around very lifelike and then oh in the in downstairs they were selling boulders actual like masses of earth and there were wim creepy stone women kind of hanging from ceilings and lurking in, in corners like they had gotten lost a thousand years ago and and i was like what the hell is this place and at one point i remember i was sitting in the corner and I, I spent about 15 minutes just reading a trade magazine entirely dedicated to the viscosity of fake blood. <laughs> like there's so many different kinds and so many different colors. And I was like, this place was 20 steps from my loop the entire time and I had no idea. Um, and just to sort of get to the point of the story, um, I remember I was, when we walked out of this place, Everything looked different. Okay, the air looked different. Um, the hue of the light was different. 
And I remember going and walking onto the sidewalk up to the edge of the curb and looking down and I saw a manhole cover. And I had this thought of, oh my fucking God, indoor plumbing. Indoor fucking plumbing. There are, there are pipes under the street that reach up into our buildings and whisk away our shit. That is astounding. And then I, I remember uh, looking up from the manhole cover and looking at the sun and thinking, that's a star. That's a fucking star. Like the only reason that we are alive, any of us, is because of the heat and the illumination of that star. How is that not front page news every single day? There's a star. New York Times. It should be, right? It was amazing to me. It was this, uh, this realization that like I spent so much time trying to figure out how the world works. Where is my place in the world? But not enough time thinking about the fact, the staggering fact that, that it exists at all. That there is something there rather than nothing. I, now I'm a pretty mellow guy. Like I, I don't generally go to these places psychologically, but I felt something profound in this moment. Um, a kind of deep, deep thankfulness. And why am I telling you this? Not just so I can show you pretty pictures of this, this sculpture shop, which, as is the way of New York, no longer exists. Um, but it beca I think the phenomenology of this experience for me tells me something that I really need to remember about not just storytelling, but about being alive. Um, if you look at the sort of sequence of events, step one, I was stuck. I was in a rut. We all get stuck. We all get stuck in ruts. Step two was I encountered something I didn't expect. Okay. But it was the third step that I had never really pondered. The way that that feeling of surprise immediately translated into a feeling of gratitude. It was that, it was that movement that I had never really contemplated. The way that surprise is almost always the first step to gratitude. And walking back from that, that sculpture shop, getting back onto my loop, I thought, oh, this is why we do it. This is why I tell stories. This is why I work so hard to find stories that are genuinely new, so that we can build these little sculpture shops that people can wander into and then uh, encounter something, wander back out of, and then suddenly realize that the ordinary reality they had just left is not ordinary at all. But, but it's extraordinary. I think this is the real reason we tell stories, is to say not just, not just to find meaning, but to say we are here, and the fact that we are here is kind of amazing. Like, I, it's, it's funny, like I, as I tell the story, I reconnect with my feelings in that moment. I remember looking at the traffic, and, and people were honking, and I was thinking, normally this is an annoying thing, but I remember thinking, isn't it amazing that those people get to be stuck in cars and get to waste time that actually was never theirs to begin with. It's kind of amazing. Um, anyhow, so I walked away from this experience with a sort of a feeling, how to put it, like almost a feeling of ethical responsibility to find the surprisingness in the everyday, in, in each other. Um, however, uh, this is where we get to sort of the squabbles. Um, fast forward a little bit. Uh, go from 2015 to 2020. Uh, around 2020, uh, so I was managing a team of about 25 journalists, and uh, uh, I, I would notice that every time we would have these story edits where people would present their stories, and I'd say, that's a good story, a good story, but you know what? I just don't think it's surprising enough. Um, it could be more surprising. I would notice there would, there would, a, a chill would enter the room. You know, no one likes criticism, so uh, it was maybe that, but also I think deeper. And in 2020, as with everything in 2020, they sort of came to a head. And I remember a group of the younger producers came up and were like, why do we have to make everything surprising? Okay? Like, there are stories that don't work that way. There are stories about, um, about uh, trauma. 
stories about crises that you might not find surprising, that you might think are boring, but are deeply important and need to be told. To which I'd say, yeah, you're right, so find a way to make them surprising. Uh, and then they would respond, well, why, would we, why do we have to do that? We have to put like, some sugary coating on the experience? Why? And I'd say, well, because no one's going to listen to it. No one's going to be open to it unless you do. Anyhow, it went back and forth and back and forth. But I felt like we were talking different languages. Um, we, something was getting lost in the translation. I was talking about the experience of the listener, that feeling of listening to a story, and you drift in and out. And then there's a moment where suddenly it feels like the, the veil is lifted and you encounter your world in an entirely new way. Um, they were talking about surprise in a kind of a sociological way, the way that surprise is used by the system, right? The way that surprise can be a, a way of sneaking in bias. Like what, what is surprising to me um, may not be surprising to someone else. Um, the way that news is so often biased towards the new, right? It is three letters of the word news. Um, and in that constant striving for newness, we often miss the important, right? Look at what's happening in Gaza right now. We are experiencing this story as, oh my God, a new thing just happened. It's a terrorist attack without realizing that there's a story that goes back, precedes it for 70 years, right? This is what we are experiencing. Uh, and that is inherently because of a bias in the news. Think about social media, the way it is uh, structured uh, around a series of incentives that just constantly dole out these little dopamine hits of surprise and keep us hooked. I think that's what they were saying. Like, stop with the bullshit. Stop with all the distraction. Let's talk about something real. And they're not wrong. They are not wrong. Um, and even though I still hold to my conviction that we have to, we must find the wondrousness in each other and even in the horrible things that befall us all, I get what they're saying. And I feel like that, my version of surprise, the positive version and their negative version somehow have to coexist. So that was one argument. Um, here's another. This is a, about a card game. Uh, actually, it's about power, but uh, cards are involved as well. So um, let's see. As a, as a, as a card-carrying old person now, I get to talk about the youngs. Uh, I feel like that's my inheritance, right? I get to complain about the young people. Actually, no, this is the opposite of complaining. So I feel like my generation, sort of the Gen Xs, we, because we were, sm we're a small, I know, right? Whoop, definitely. <laughs> There's so few of us. There's so few of us. We're such a small generation. We have so little impact on the world. Um, we try, right? We, we, we enter into the adult world and we are like, wow, okay, this, just, this is all like, we're just going to keep our heads down and try, and try and make things happen. Whereas this generation, I feel, has a very different orientation. Um, they are exquisitely aware of power in all contexts. They walk into a room, they can immediately suss out who has the power and who doesn't, and they orient everything around that, as they should. Right? This came up for me in a really obscure context, in a, uh, a fussy little battle between two endeavors that are basically the same thing, uh, journalism and oral history. So uh, journalism um, is orient oriented around the sort of the, the sense that like we, we will speak truth to power. And when I walk into an interview, I own the mic, and I'm going to point the mic at a person, and I'm going to ask some meaningful questions. I'm going to get something from them and take it to my audience. That is the sort of basic idea of journalism. Oral history um, is a little bit different in that it, um, it's also about gathering stories, but it, it differs in how it treats the subject and how much power it gives to the subject. And because with oral history, there, the audience isn't really that important. No one listens to oral histories. Um, I mean, no, it's, that's, that's just the truth. Uh, but there's the archive. That's kind of your audience. And, and so uh, an oral historian will do everything that they can to make the subject feel comfortable and to give the subject some bit of power. So uh, again, around 2020, uh, we, uh, some of the younger producers on the staff uh, 
were interested in inviting in an oral historian to come talk to the team. Because uh, we do this thing uh, every other Friday, kind of like this, but way smaller, where somebody comes in and gives a talk. So an oral historian came in, and she laid out her method. First thing she said is, when we interview people, we always show them the questions in advance. Uh, chill enters the room. <laughs> Second thing that she said is, and she, to really to underline the point was, we, do, we, we always make the subject comfortable. Let's imagine that we sent the questions in advance and the subject said, great, but then on the day of the interview, the subject was like, oh, I don't really want to answer those questions. I just want to talk about potato chips. So she said, well, okay, let's talk about potato chips. What kind of potato chips do you like? Uh, do you like crunchy, wavy? And at that point, I remember it started a generational war <laughs> in the staff. The, old, the older producers were like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> potato chips? I owe it to my audience to ask meaningful questions. That is a dereliction of duty to just go down the potato. No, no. Whereas the young people were saying, no, 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 no. It's, it's just a different way to behave. It's just a different way to honor our subjects. And why do we even call them subjects? Like, they, like they're like these, pe these things in a Petri dish. No, we want to call them co-authors, to which the olds were like, G -g -n -n no, no. <laughs> the moment you call them a co-author, you have lost your journalistic independence. Um, and it went on and on and on, this debate. We had like eight meetings about it. And it was, it's fascinating to me, this conversation. As I've stepped away from the show, uh, I think about it all the time. You know, I mean, there is a way in which uh, you know, we like. If I'm interviewing a politician, I, I am not going to talk about potato chips, right? I, I do have a duty in that in that regard because the politician has power. But they're also like I, I found myself reflecting about some of the stories we've told over the years, and some somehow it didn't sit right with me anymore in light of these objections. I remember, and this is a sort of a nothing example, but I remember we interviewed a, a five-year-old kid once in like 2006. This five-year-old kid, it was kind of a nothing story. I remember it was a, the kid sang a song and it was super cute, so we put it in, in the story. And then um, continued to air that story for years and years and years. And that kid had now graduated college, but him as a five-year-old is still circulating on, on, on Radiolab, and I know we didn't get consent for that. <laughs> and even if we had, even if we'd gone to the parents and said, hey, can we have consent to air this, uh, the, this, this in perpetuity, and they said yes, that would still be weird. So there is some way in which we do need to give our subjects um, more control, more autonomy. So I was sort of waffling between these two uh, principles, thinking, is there a way forward? And then I bumped into a woman named Elisa Del Tufo, who is, uh, she teaches at Bennington College in Vermont, trained as an oral historian. For years she spent uh, interviewing women who were survivors of domestic abuse, kids who came from violent homes, and she uh, developed this fascinating technique where she would basically play a card game with them. She would, uh, particularly with kids, she would ask them to, she'd, She'd have a card, she'd have a, let me actually show you the next slide, I'll make it clear. She'd have a series of questions that she would write on the cards and she would leave certain cards blank. And then she would allow the kids to write the questions that they wanted to answer on the blank cards. And then you would shuffle the cards and then pick a card and then choose which one to answer. And I was like, well, you just let them write their own questions? How do you keep them from writing like real softball questions? And she was like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what happens. They write the most baller questions on those cards, like questions I would never have the courage to ask, but that they want to answer. And as soon as they draw those cards, uh, that's the one they go for. And I thought, that's so interesting. What an interesting blend um, in that you, I mean, people do want to have the deep conversations, right? But they also want to do it on their own terms. And so this is a way to insert the questions that you feel you need to insert as a journalist, but also give the subjects some control. 
And I offer this uh, to you as inspiration. Um, but, you know, I've done this now the last uh, 18 months. I've done this four or five times, and it's, it's always been a really interesting conversation that happens. But more broadly, as inspiration, um, for all those times when the world sort of presents you with, with two options and says, this is it, pick, I feel like there's, uh, there's, that's, there's never just two options. There's always a different way to, to proceed. One of the, one of the, th the uh, principles that I try and live by is to always find what Jessica Benjamin, psychotherapist, refers to as the third. She wrote a book called Beyond Doer and Done To, where she talks about this thing that she calls the third. And the idea is basically that we like to think of ourselves as these autonomous units where I do something to you and you do something to me and we transact back and forth. But what the third is, it, it's this idea that when two people come together and they really commit to each other, they commit to seeing one another, and yet there's a little bit of space between them and they also hold the space. In that space, something new can happen. Something new that perhaps is the relationship that they create. They create something that is separate from both of them, which she calls the third. And as I sort of reflect forward, now that I've stepped away from Radio Lab and from journalism for the moment, and I think about what do I want to do with my work, with my life, and increasingly that's projects about music, projects, theater pieces, uh, sound installations. In all of it, I ask myself, how can I find the third? That place where the differences we hold as so true suddenly resolve themselves into something new. Thank you guys.